Um, hi, everyone. It's a really great honor to uh, give a presentation here today uh, with uh, several of the very Rising Star uh, scholars um, and uh, published in the same issue with them. So it's really my great honor. Um, today, um, I think we, we, are, we will ask you to uh, talk about the papers, uh, but I think my research in recent years on dielectric elastomer artificial muscles are like more like a complete story. So I would like to expand a little bit beyond this uh, published paper and talk about the whole story. And hopefully this can uh, generate more discussion and uh, more interesting ideas. Uh, so Dr. Fan has uh, introduced me, so I will skip uh, this introduction part, but I would like to mention that when I was at Harvard, I've heard the Papan's name for many times, especially from uh, Kevin. Uh, and unfortunately we don't have overlap, but I think we are from the same lab. Okay, so um, the area that I work on is called the soft robots. So why do we work on soft robots when the robots has been developed so advanced? Uh, this is because in some extreme environments like the narrow spaces, like some clustered environment and some extreme environment like the, um, the, the pressure and environment are very extreme. And also in some other cases like the humans and the robot are in very close interaction. There are two challenges for robots. One is the, the adaptivity for the environment and the other is the safety um, of, of the robots to humans. So just from this point of view, uh, software robots has been developed in the past 10 years, and this area is uh, growing very uh, rapidly. Uh, many types of uh, uh, robots made of software material have been developed uh, in the past 10 years. So here I have a comparison diagram showing the difference of traditional robots and soft robots. So if you uh, look at the actuation method, so most of the robots uh, currently in use, especially the industrial robot and also collaborative robot, they use servo motor and reducer as actuation, which means that it is the motor that generated the, the, the motion um, of the robots. But soft robots usually use softer materials as actuation, and we call it artificial muscles. And also, if you look at the sensing um, uh, components of it, so most of the uh, traditional robots use the, like a false torque sensor or other types of uh, encoders, which are also rigid. And so they are very compatible with uh, um, the industrial robots. But soft robots, because the whole body is soft and stretchable, we have to develop new types of uh, sensors, which we which we call it such as artificial skin to sense itself and also their interactive force with the world, with the world, yeah. So the hidden like uh, uh, theory behind uh, uh, robots, traditional robots is usually the kinematics and the dynamics of rigid bodies. Um, and in contrast, uh, soft robots need mechanics and dynamics of elastomers and the continuum to establish its whole model. So, so this is a comparison uh, for you to understand what is a soft robot. So my research area basically falls in the previous a few very important components of soft robots, including soft actuation, soft sensing, and also because it is made of softer materials, it's very nonlinear and also experience large strain. So we need the soft robotic controllers to make it uh, uh, to be autonomous. And finally, some novel fabrication techniques to make these soft robots is very different from uh, previous machining and assembly process. So today I would like to uh, focus on, uh, sorry, and also apply those uh, fundamental components to different systems like uh, uh, micro aero vehicles and access like skeletons and variables and other types of uh, robots that we use these software technologies to advance such application areas. So today I would like to focus on this uh, soft actuation method and hopefully in the future I got the chance to introduce other aspects as well. So another uh, point of view of why we work on soft actuation, you can see it from this chart. So we can see that most of the systems that has a very good uh, moving capability, like the automobiles, like the humans ourselves, and also industrial robots, they all have very excellent actuators, like the engines or other uh, biological muscles and also the motors. The motors has been developed for 200 years, and now in the market, you can find any um, very reliable and of long life cycle motors that you want to use. But for the next generation robot, we want it to adapt to different environment. We want it to work closely with humans. Here I have a question mark of what is actuator for next generation of um, uh, robots. So this is a general motivation of why we work on soft actuation. 
So the type of soft activator I work on is called the dielectric elastomer actuators. Its mechanism or physical principle is very simple. It is a sandwiched uh, structure with uh, compliant electrodes on both sides and also a, a deformable uh, a substrate in the middle, so that when you apply an electric field across these two electrodes, there is Maxwell forces that will squeeze the middle section and let it to expand, just like showing in this video. So this technology has been developed for many years. It can be dated back to 300 years ago, when some old phys physicians are working on the electricity, they collect um, static electricity, they collect the charges using a uh, equipment called the Leyden jar. And they found that if they overcharge this jar, um, the, the wall of this jar would be squeezed and even break. So this is a big force um, just by this charging process. And then this technology is not developing very fast until the 2000s. So 2000, the powering, uh, some people from uh, Stanford in, uh, Research Institute developed a, a type of actuator that generates a very large energy density, which is about 3,400 joules per kilogram. So this is a few hundred higher than that of a motor. So this area started to uh, develop very fast, especially in recent years. So every year in Nature or Science, there is a paper about uh, dielectric elastomer actuators. Uh, including a few days ago, um, Professor Pei from UCLA developed a new type of uh, a material for dielectric elastomers that generate a large um, uh, uh, energy density for this type of actuation. So from these literatures, we can definitely see that the performance of these uh, physical principles has been demonstrated very sufficiently. Um, but how to implement this technology into a uh, into a like a practical large scale uh, products is still under investigation. So uh, here I would like to summarize some of the pros and cons of this technology. So the pros of this technology is that it is a very fast responses. This is in comparison with uh, some other like uh, heat driven actuators such as the shape memory alloys, which might have a uh, uh, actuation time up to a few seconds, but this one can go down to a few milliseconds. So it can be fast enough to be used in any robotic applications. And another thing is it will generate a very large strain. So we don't need another like uh, uh, transmission to amplify this strain or amplify the force. It can directly be used to drive a mechanism. And the third one is it is directly controlled by electricity so that we can utilize our electricity, our circuit design to make a, a integrated system. However, there are some disadvantages about it. Uh, three very important ones include it is driving by very high voltage, usually several kilovolts. So this makes the, the um, transformer from the low voltage to high voltage to be very bulky. And another thing is it is very prone to breakdown, which means in, sometimes in the first few hundred the cycles, it is working very well, generating a very large energy and power. However, its uh, performance started to drop as time goes along. So we have to increase the stability and our life cycle of this technology. And the last one is currently this technology has not been used in our practical uh, uses, mainly because there is no scalable manufacturing methods to mass product these uh, type of actuators. So our goal is trying to reduce the voltage to some uh, sub 1000 volts level and also increase the lifetime uh, tremendously and finally develop some functional configurations to be in direct use in robotics. So uh, based on these goals, we have developed such a linear small actuator. This actuator is, um, is uh, produced by first laminating many layers of these dielectric elastomer sandwiches. This is because we want each layer to be very thin to reduce the voltage. And then we roll it into a linear actuator. So this actuator works by if you give it a charge and then it will expand in its axial direction. So this linear actuator is a very typical type of, um, uh, we can call it a motor um, in the robotic theory. And then we can use another transmission system to transmit this motion into all types of other motions like this flapping motions or other types of motions. And uh, we also developed a scalable manufacturing method to make it 
So this manufacturing method is quite scalable. Um, if you want to make a larger uh, actuator, you can just expand uh, the, the films and also the masks as well as the carbon fiber electrodes so that it, you can mass produce some of them. And uh, for this uh, special configuration, we also want to understand how the geometries and the material properties are affecting its force and displacement output. So we established a few models to understand it. And the first one is a uh, static model that we can transform the properties of the materials as well as the ge geometries into its force output and displacement output. And this is not enough because in most cases, we want to use it in a dynamic mode. So we also need to consider its dynamic characteristics like the resistance and the capacitance circuit, like the electrical model, and also the mechanic model that we will consider the viscosity of the material and also the elasticity of the material so that we can form a complete um, mechanical electrical uh, a coupled model. And this model is quite effective in predicting the motions of the actuator so that we don't need to every time make an actuator and then uh, characterize it. We can directly substitute some of the material characters and also the geometries to predict its output. This is very useful in especially when you want to design a robot that it, you need it to satisfy specific requirements. Okay, now that we have a uh, usable uh, functional configuration, the next question is how do we expand its uh, uh, longevity or the life cycle of it? So here we have utilized a special phenomenon called the self-clearing. This means that if we have some defects in the material and then it will, there will be some local breakdown happens here. However, this local breakdown will cause some current and then some heat and then burn out some of the dielectrics as well as some of the electrodes. Because our electrodes is very thin and easy to burn, so they will vaporize easily and clear out an area that will no longer break down. So that even though we have a defect here that can only resist a much lower uh, dielectric strength, but this, one, this place can be pre-cleared uh, before we use this structure. And we utilized this phenomenon and uh, developed a self a clearing process to pre-process this actuator. And then all these uh, weak places can be cleared out. And we also have uh, used an indicator, we call it a capacitance retainer, so that we know how much areas or how much volumes we have sacrificed to make this actuator finally work. And this is a quite uh, a useful indicator to monitor the system. So we tested this material into uh, up to 10,000 million, uh, 10 million times uh, so that we use our indicator to track how much capac uh, capacitance, how much like a uh, capability it still uh, has uh, during the self-clearing uh, process. So we can see that up to a million times, it still has about 90% of its actuation, actuating capability. And up to 10 million times, it still have about 30% of its actuation capability. So if we can go to this many time cycle, we could use it in some robotic applications. So this uh, uh, self-clearing uh, phenomenon could also be utilized to uh, some uh, damage recovery during the actuator is in use. For example, we use uh, uh, scissors to cut it through and uh, this self-clearing can clear out these places. Even though so it has some drop in its uh, actuating capability, we could still use it to some extent. So based on the above uh, uh, fabrication modeling and also pre-process uh, uh, study, we have developed this uh, damage recovery and the long life cycle and the stable uh, artificial muscles. And the good thing is, its power density is as high as the biological muscles. Initially, at 1,000 volts, we have got about 80 volts per uh, kilogram. This is almost the same as our humans, but uh, humans muscles. So the next question is, so for this one, it has very high actuation frequency and also have very good uh, uh, power density. What type of applications we could use such uh, actuator to demonstrate its capability and also to advance the development of robotic systems. 
So here I would like to introduce a few. The first one is we developed a variable flexible haptic arrays that use our actuators to generate a linear compressive force on a human's forearm. And because our actuators is frequency, amplitude, and also which one is actuated can be controlled by electricity, we can transfer information to humans through the haptics. So this is basically the uh, diagram of it. And also we carefully uh, isolated the system so that uh, uh, it won't uh, generate a spark to human skin, as well as characterize its thermal and temperature characteristics. And finally, we recruited uh, a few volunteers to try this one. And uh, finally, uh, the result is humans forearm are quite sensitive to distinguish the different actuation frequencies and the positions of the actuators. So which means the actuation frequency and uh, amplitude is large enough to be used as a variable technologies. This is the first one. And there is another one. Uh, Papan just mentioned it before. When I was at Harvard, I, I talked with um, one of my colleagues, Kevin, and uh, he told me that his wings is as efficient as a biological wing. And I told him that the artificial muscles I developed is as powerful as the artificial muscle. So we think, why can't we combine them together and make a flapping wing, make an artificial muscle driven flapping wing? So we combine these two technologies together and achieve the, the first flight of the flapping when that is actuated by artificial muscles. So during the process, we have overcome a few other challenges that we didn't think of at the start of this project, uh, such as the, the soft and rigid interfaces is really hard to bond it together. This part is very important, both mechanically and also electrically. So we have tried all types of adhesives to bond them together. And finally, it can uh, endure more than 1 million times of actuation. And also we found that the soft actuators used in the system also experience some unexpected uh, modes of motion. For example, this one, when it is working at a high frequency, initially we, we wanted it to generate an axial force. Unfortunately, at some frequencies, the bending mode has been activated so that the force in the axial direction is not large enough to generate enough lift for the vehicle to take off. So we have mechanically constrained some of the other motions of soft actuators. Uh, and I believe this is one of the common problems related to uh, uh, soft actuators. We have to make sure the correct uh, mode of motion is generated. Uh, finally, after a few um, months of uh, really uh, hard work, we achieved the, the first flight of this uh, a vehicle. And then after a few years of uh, controlling, uh, we, we achieved the, the controlled hovering of these robots. So this is a very direct demonstration showing that our uh, actuator, our artificial muscle is of very high power density. Otherwise it cannot lift itself. So recently we were also thinking of uh, um, where can we use our actuators to some other areas. So we look at uh, the aircraft engine and we found that there are many types of pipes that need to be re uh, inspected regularly from the outside. So the common way to inspect these kind of tubes is to use an endoscope and some carbon fiber and some uh, optical fibers to go into it and see it. So this process is very time consuming and also need very expert engineers to conduct this process. So we were thinking, can we develop a mobile robot that, that can autonomously go over all these very complex pipes and do this inspection by itself and send back all the images so that we can check if there is any defects in the internal walls of the pipes. So we have developed this robot to, um, we call it a pipeline inspection robot to go into these pipes. So our robot is a structure, it's not very complex. It is made of uh, two anchors and a body. And this is inspired from uh, the very common creature, which is the earthworms. So if you look at the uh, motions of the earthworms, it has a very simple uh, motion mechanism called the peristalsis. So the body period periodically extends and contracts and the hair like a settle uh, periodically anchor and de-anchor so that the, the robot is moving forward. So we simply used this mechanism to design this tube climbing or pipe inspection robot. 
And uh, we need to design both the body and also the settle, or we call it an anchor. So the body is easy because our artificial muscles is the motion mode is uh, extending and contracting. Um, how do we design the settle? So here is our design. So we have designed a very small anchoring unit uh, that uses uh, the uh, smart composite, uh, uh, composite material uh, masses that we use different materials and the laser cut into different shape and then bound them together using hot press and uh, finally assemble it into this structure. This structure can change, can transform the radio uh, force into the, uh, it can, it can transform uh, the axial force into the radio expansion so that it can be used to fit into the pipes and working as anchors. And here's a video showing how it works, both at low frequency and high frequency. So we just need to put our actuators into this uh, uh, structure and it, it can be used as an anchor. So the anchors actually and the bodies are using two different types of materials. One is uh, silicone that has a very low Young's modulus and also relatively high viscosity. And the other is of very high stiffness and very low viscosity. So we chose these two different materials because for this body actuator, we wanted to generate a large displacement. And for this anchor actuator, we wanted to generate a large force. So we use two types of the materials, but because um, the dynamic properties of the two are very different. So for the soft materials, it uh, shows a very complex uh, uh, dynamic sweep if you go uh, uh, frequency sweep. And for this rigid one, it is almost like a zero order system. It doesn't change its property too much at high frequencies. So we will utilize this in the, in the future. So for this uh, anchor system, you can see that using voltage, we can control the frequency, uh, the, the frictions with the uh, pipe walls uh, very effectively. And uh, the force difference, the frictional force difference is about 70 millinewton. This is about three times of the mass of our robot itself. So it is large enough to hold the robot and let it to crawl vertically. Um, and then we use a modular assembly uh, method to assemble this robot into different uh, configurations. So you can choose how much uh, segments you want it to be in the middle. If you want a small crawling robot, you can just use in one segment. But if you want it to be more soft and adapted to more complex pipes, you can use multiple segments. Um, so now we are ready to let the robot go. But we found that. Um, even though we have made tremendous efforts to make the actuator generate more displacement, um, it still have so tiny as right, uh, only a few hundred uh, micron. So this is really, really small. So how to make it faster? And the most direct thinking is just increasing the stride frequency. Unfortunately, speed does not increase with frequency. It doesn't mean that you actuate faster and it will go faster. This is due to the dynamic properties of the materials starts to play an important role. So the inertia, the elasticity, and the viscosity are all playing roles in the dynamic performance of the actuator. So to solve this problem, we have to establish a connecting model to describe everything. We want to include the viscosity, the elasticity, the inertia, and also the um, dynamics of the rigid parts all into a model. So we divided our system into three segments and each draw the three body diagrams of it. And we found there are in total seven unknowns, um, which is the center of mass acceleration of the three segments and also the interactive force between them and also the frictional force of the anchors with the walls. So we have to find some equations to solve this whole problem. We first write out the four very obvious one, which is just the uh, the force balance of the three segments and also some uh, um, displacement relationship. And then we found that uh, if we find the boundary conditions of it in four different cases, the four different boundary conditions, including the front ankle is anchoring and the back one is sliding and uh, the verse, uh, and also both are anchored and both are sliding, the four different uh, uh, boundary conditions. So we can add another two equations, but we're still missing one. And the last missing one equation is the most important one. This one happens in the middle body actuator uh, modeling. So this one, you can see if we can find the forces 
uh, compressing it. In theory, we could find out its uh, uh, displacement or its deformation. However, this is a little bit complex because F1 and F2 are not uh, always equal. So this piece of rubber is not in static. Instead, its center of mass is accelerating in space. So there are inertial forces as well. So our way to uh, do it is we distributed uh, these inertial forces into this piece of rubber. And then we can find its external forces. It is not only related to F1 and F2, but also related to the inertia. And then we use the Kevin model, Kevin Bolt model to uh, establish the viscoelasticity of it and establish uh, and uh, substitute it into this uh, stress. So the stress is caused by uh, the external forces as well as the maximum forces caused by the voltage. And finally, we integrate these strains and we find the deformation of this actuator at a certain uh, force, external forces and a certain voltages. So and I think this is a bit complex. Uh, if you are very interested, you can refer to our paper and also the codes to run this uh, simulation. So we use MATLAB and ODE45, uh, these tools to simulate the motions of actuator. It can be clearly seen that at high frequencies, the phase plays a very important role. The phase means initially we should, uh, at low frequency, we run this actuator in this mode, but later we need to correct this phase so that it can move fast. And here is a map that we, we draw of how frequency and phase are changing the speed of the uh, robot. So in our practical uses, practical actuation of the actuator. We have to correct the physics to make it run fast. Also, the physics can also change the direction of the uh, robot as well. So now we have used the phase correction to achieve the very high uh, motional speed of the robots and uh, utilizing a softer body, it can go into different uh, types of uh, um, pipes like uh, the L-shaped, S-shaped and the spiral shape. Also, it can work very effectively vertically and also horizontally. Um, some other interesting parts of our, our robot is it can not only work in normal spaces, a normal environment. If you change the material of the pipe and also the internal diameter is changing or the, even the pipe is filled with some other mediums like oil, it can also work effectively in it. Uh, I think someone is reading his chat. I think we can talk about that a little bit later. So uh, finally, our robot achieved a, a relatively good performance in terms of motion. Its body, its speed is more than one body length per second. Okay, I will speed up. So finally, we demonstrated the whole system into uh, a real pipe and uh, equipped it with a miniature camera. And then it can see the walls of the uh, pipes very clearly. Okay, so I have uh, demonstrated uh, three applications for this actuator. Um, and here I want to say that um, perhaps this question can be partially answered. So I, I believe the next generation robots will have all types of actuators, not only just the one type. So they feed into different environments and different frequencies and you can pick which one you want to use when certain, uh, um, when certain environment uh, happens. Okay. Uh, so I will just skip this slide and uh, would like to thank all my collaborators, including my PhD advisor uh, and my postdoc advisor, Rob Wood, a PhD advisor, Rob Sheffer, and also currently my uh, student and postdoc. Special thanks to Dr. Uh, Tang Chao, who is the first author of the paper, who has made a tremendous contribution to this paper. Okay, thank you. Sorry, um, I am a little you. running out of time. Well, I, I think the right exactly uh, uh, right at the time. I think maybe okay. you say, you already say one or two minutes. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Huichang. Um, uh, uh, so now we are open to questions. Um, uh, okay, um, there's one in the chat box. I can read it uh, for you. Uh, mm -hmm. So from Ming Shan He. Uh, if I pronounce correctly, I uh, I have started in soft robotics recently. Uh, the material um, in your presentation uh, needs high voltage, which may limit the application. And the self recovery is so exciting. 
Uh, I want to inquire what topics or aspects you will be considered in the future work or designing a soft robot. Oh, I think this is a really good question. So, of course, um, these dielectric elastomers is uh, driven by very high voltage. Even though we, we are trying to reduce the voltage, it is still a few hundred volts or even, a thousand, uh, even over a thousand volts. Uh, so I believe that this type of actuation, it doesn't apply to all applications, but, but there are some specific scenarios that uh, high voltage is not a problem. For example, the one that we, we were working on, this pipeline inspection robot. Um, anyway, you need a safety tether too, so that it won't be stuck there. And this high voltage is not in direct contact with humans or uh, other materials. So I think there are some scenarios that high voltage is not a problem. Uh, but of course, if, if someone, if some really good experts can reduce the voltage to more than, to less than 100 volts, that will be a breakthrough. Um, yes, self-clearing is really important in expanding the life cycle of the actuators. Um, in terms of our future work, I think we will keep on increasing the uh, the basic performance of the actuator, as well as its life cycle, and at, at the same time, find more application areas for it. Okay, 